a body. Let's get there. Okay, okay. we are ready for more gravitational waves, and we have Michele Balisneri. Thank you. So, um, before talking a bit about data analysis today, I wanted to, to share the new results that I couldn't, uh, I couldn't talk about yesterday for, you know, I don't know, for legal reasons or for reasons of secrecy, but some of you actually met in a, in a room on the side to watch this press release by the LIGO collaboration, LIGO and Virgo collaboration. So what did they show yesterday? Uh, I have some uh, uh, plots actually from the paper that was just uh, published yesterday in Physical Review Letters. And basically, there's one more event. There's one more good detection, which was named the uh, GW151226. So as you can see, we're still going with the GW, although IAU wants GRAV. Uh, and uh, that's the date. So uh, in, in honor of our uh, British colleagues, it was named the Boxing Day event. So Boxing Day is uh, <laughs> December 26. Although for most of the US, it was still, at the time when the, this thing was detected, it was still Christmas. Okay, so this generated a, a series uh, of, of stories of people being taken away from their uh, gift wrapping or gift opening to do data analysis. And as you can see, this was not as strong as the uh, September and the first Monday event was. Uh, it was longer, though. So what you see there is, uh, again, the spectrogram, or something, actually, that's called a, an omega scan, is, is a more refined and tuned version of a spectrogram, um, showing very faintly the upward chirp, right, at the bottom. Um, I think I have a pointer also. And, uh, but the, the time series, uh, even if these are already widened and been passed, don't, don't really show noise. The signal is under there, and the black is not, uh, is not the signal as you get it from the data, is the signal that you infer is in the data. Okay, so this needed digging out from the noise, and throughout today's lecture, I'm going to try to show you how uh, you can be certain that, you know, something like this is really under this noise, is really there, and uh, is there with great confidence. Mm. Now, the, the other thing that you may see is that the signal is much longer. Okay, the or, original Monday event was just eight cycles. Uh, here, you can actually make out 55 uh, within the, there are 55 cycles of the signal in the, um, in the sensitive band of the instrument. So, uh, if you've, uh, you know, if you listen carefully to what I was trying to teach you, uh, what gets you a longer signal? And if you haven't seen yesterday's uh, <laughs> you know, press release, because you then, then you know already. How do you get a, a, a signal that lasts longer in the detector band? So you know, it actually goes to a higher frequency. It goes to about, uh, what is it, 450 hertz, something like that. Come on. Let's be interactive. You know, Shirley was inspiring yesterday. So let's, let's try. Let's, uh, so what kind of masses would you need? Smaller, right? You need smaller masses to, to be able to last longer and get closer. And uh, uh, so smaller masses make also small black holes. Small black holes can get closer before they merge, and therefore you can push the, uh, the system to higher frequency. Um, this lasted one second, okay? And, and this is a comparison of the, then the three signals that were seen in the 48 days of LIGO's uh, first observational run. These were 48 days in coincidence, okay? It's, it's the only time where you trust yourself to be able to see something. Um, so this here is just the noise profile, just a spectrum of noise for the two detectors, Hanford and Livingston. Um, and uh, these three are the reconstructions of the three signals. You see GW15, the, the first Monday, was very short and lower frequency. Uh, this one lasts a lot longer, more cycles. And this is LVT, is this, uh, this signal that happened uh, um, in October. Well, it's the second Monday event, um, which uh, was kind of in between. It's not a confident detection. There's, uh, there's uh, only a 90% uh, probability that it's actually a signal. And so the corresponding false alarm rate is something like uh, one in three years. Um, so uh, some of the properties, SNR, Signal to noise ratio, right? The statistic that tells you how, both how strong a signal is and how confident you are in its detection was uh, 20, 24 for the first one, very strong. This one, 13, okay? 
and the, uh, the marginal one was 9.7. So between 9 and 10 is where your threshold of really certainty uh, falls. And the certainty goes exponentially, as we see with the SNR squared effect. So it's, it's kind of like a steep. Uh, if you're at 11 or 12, you're already uh, in, in very good shape. Uh, and let's see, what else? Uh, distance of the uh, Boxing Day event was comparable. Although there's a big uncertainty on this number, but it was comparable to the first Monday, so 0.1. And in this one, it was possible to see a spin. But the most interesting thing, perhaps, is these masses. So these are masses that are more reasonable for black holes, okay? They're not the outrageous uh, 36 that you needed to change, uh, for which you need to change the theory of uh, binary evolution. Uh, they're things that we've seen also in X-ray binaries. So uh, I guess the trivial statement is that uh, uh, nature produces black holes that merge across a range of masses, not just 36. Um, that's interesting you know, from, from, the, from the dark matter right, perspective. So there's this paper that we were talking about briefly that I looked at again, which proposes that uh, um, all dark matter are 30 solar masses black holes, effectively. And then it uh, works out, uh, if, if, you, if you take all the dark matter you have you know, in galactic halos and so on, you, may, you build all, all of that out of 30 solar mass black holes, which were produced as primordial black holes, right? not from, from just evolution what kind of uh, uh, merging rate you get. And the merging rate is kind of compatible with what uh, uh, was inferred from uh, uh, the first Monday event. Um, however, I think that lighter black holes like that, 14 and 7.5, are already um, would be seen by microlensing. Probably there are constraints that cut them out. So maybe not all dark matter is 30 solar masses black holes, and at least it can be a mix. It's a very interesting suggestion, though. Um, if you look at that paper, it's a, maybe a, it's a physical review letter, I think, and it's a, it's a bunch of authors. Um, most of the work there is to try to figure out what merger rate you'd have in gravitational waves if you put all those black holes there. Um, because it, it, you get different merger rates depending you know, how clumpy, how, uh, what, what the clumpiness is of, of the black hole dark matter in that sense. Okay, so uh, these are these uh, significant plots that I, I was showing yesterday at the colloquium. The idea is uh, um, there's, an, there's this number, okay, 23 or 13 that you compute, it tells you how strong the signal is with respect to noise. If you really believe that noise was uh, perfect, Gaussian described uh, uh, exactly by that spectrum without any uh, bad surprises, well, then uh, you could just compute what the false alarm rate is for uh, a signal that you've detected. But since you don't trust that, you don't trust the instrument to actually be ideal in that sense, what you want to do is to try to measure how many uh, triggers, how many false alarms uh, um, you get from noise alone. You do that by doing uh, coincidence between time-shifted um, time, time shifted, uh, um, time series for the two detectors. Actually, um, who was at yesterday's colloquium? Just so I know if the, I can as, assume that. Okay, not quite everybody. So I'm, I'm going then to repeat myself a little bit. Um, time shifting, okay? So the, the idea goes back to Joe Weber, 1960s. Uh, you have a very noise experiment that gives you triggers. Okay, you keep it going, and every now and then it goes bing. You suspect that it will go bing when there's a gravitational wave, but it may do that also for other reasons. There's a cosmic ray, there's something local that went wrong. So what you do, you build another identical one, and now you're asking for coincidence. You put them in different buildings or in different cities, and you synchronize your clocks, and now they have to go bing together. Okay, for that, for you to believe that it's a gravitational wave. Fine, it, it, it's a nice principle. How do you quantify it? How do you actually compute probabilities on that? Well, uh, um, what you could do uh, is to say, um, is to say I'm going to, 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 uh, to take the probability uh, that uh, I, either one goes bing by measuring how many bings I have, just multiply the two, and that's the probability of my false alarm. Um, but what you can also do is to, uh, is to effectively build a longer experiment by taking uh, coincidences that are shifted in time. So I have a day, uh, I have a day of data, of triggers, of bings, uh, another day, and I shift it by one hour, and then I, I, I figure out when 
I get random coincidences between them. And then they have to be random because the gravitational wave is just coming you know, simultaneously to both. It's not waiting an hour to go to the second one. That's building a background by way of time slides. And, uh, and that's what these histograms are. Um, in doing that, there's this, uh, uh, so, so the, this is the, the, you know, the first Monday event, the big one. And the, the background that you measure, actually, does this start? No, this starts here. This is the big, big event, way more significant than any coincidence that you get from, uh, from the other one. However, what's this hump here? Okay, these, uh, these are these little dogs. And by the way, little dog is a, is a shibboleth. Okay, who knows what the shibboleth is? Nobody? Yes, <laughs> this one. A shibboleth is a word or a concept that shows that you belong to a community. Okay, I think it may be a Hebrew word, perhaps, originally, but it's, uh, uh, so when you hear somebody talking, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's something that gives away that they're one of yours, basically, because nobody else would know it outside the community. So this little dog thing, except that now, you know, people like me tell you, is something that's not in the papers, but it's something that was in countless emails and in internal uh, collaborations. Um, and the origin of the name is actually the following, that uh, there was this big uh, blind injection exercise in 2006, maybe 2007, um, where uh, a big signal was put in the data just to see if the data, data analysts could get it out. It was blind because they weren't told when uh, uh, it was across the, uh, the observing run. Also, uh, we weren't told whether there were zero, one, or two events put in. So it could have been zero, it could have been two. Now, this was detected, and it was detected as coming from the Canis Major okay, constellation, that direction in the sky. So that event, which was, uh, you know, a, a paper was written about it actually internally because the, the point of the exercise was not, not just to see if you could detect it, it was also to see uh, how the collaboration would go about vetting it and, and being sure about it and writing a paper. So there, there's an aborted paper somewhere in there. Uh, so because that was in the Canis Meyer, so the big dog, basically, a constellation, that event become, became known as Big Dog. Uh, and, uh, and that was the first time, actually, one uh, was kind of doing this exercise for, with a very strong signal. And so there was this point of what to do with these kind of humps that, uh, that you got. Because when you're doing the time shifting, you have time, some time shifts that have in one interferometer the big dog, right, the, the, the big guy, and nothing in the other one. You still get uh, a high probability of having something, okay? Because you, you get a very high alarm in one interferometer, you, you, you get some smaller random chance thing in the other one, and together they give you a strong, uh, they give you a, a relatively large trigger. So this became known as the little dogs and the little dog problem, and uh, you know, there were lots of discussions how to deal with it statistically. Now, we have a pretty uh, well established uh, procedure, which is you start with a stronger signal. Uh, and then, when you want to look at the uh, lower signal, you actually take it out. And you, don't, you take it out of the data so that you don't get the little dogs when you're doing, uh, uh, when you're doing uh, time shift coincidences. So this takes you down from this black histogram to the purple one and to this plot. And now you can assess the significance of the GW15 um, with respect of... Uh, uh, I guess the non-humpy one with respect to this black curve. There's still, it's still not quite, right, Gaussian, but uh, um, the, the minus eight and so on. And then if you want to look at the last one, you, you take even this one out of the, uh, of the computation. So if you do this, uh, both the first Monday, September event and the Christmas event have very large significance. So the false alarm rate is actually uh, less than you can measure. It's less than uh, six, 10 to the minus seven, which is uh, one in 600,000 years. Okay, moving on to parameter estimation. These are the three, um, the three events with the, the estimated masses um, and, and other parameters. So I think these are one sigma and two sigma contours in parameter space. So they contain either, what is it, 68% or 95% of probability. So you can see definitely GW15 was the highest mass of 36 and something like 29. This region is excluded because M1 is always larger than M2, okay? Just uh, uh, for 
uh, definiteness, and uh, th this one, GW15, uh, is definitely lower mass, uh, with LVT being kind of in the middle, but very uncertain, especially the, um, yeah, the, the mass ratio between the two is very uncertain. Uh, correspondingly, these are the masses of the final remnant black hole and the spin of the final uh, remnant black hole. These are not, mostly not measured directly, uh, they're inferred effectively from your general relativistic models of what merging black holes do through numerical relativity. Uh, then we have, uh, this is uh, Q, is the mass ratio, so it goes from zero to one, right? GW15, the original one, prefers almost equal masses. For this uh, LVT and GW, you basically don't know. It's very uncertain. You have a good idea of the total mass, but not so much of the mass ratio. And uh, there's some degeneracy with the, this is the effective spin. So it's the, it's the uh, projection of the two spins onto the angular momentum, which is the combination of spin that affects the inspiral rate. Um, finally, distance. Okay, so comparable distances for, uh, for the two strong ones. A much broader thing, but probably farther distance for LVT, which is fainter after all and sky positions, okay? So this was 600 degrees and people were complaining about this already, but they, they would have had more to complain about uh, the other ones where you can effectively, um, there's a ring, right, in the sky. It's a broken ring, except it's, it's, it's kind of, it's a weird projection, but that's, that's what it is. You, you do timing, you do triangulation with a line, not a triangle, you end up with a ring. Um, so I haven't heard yet from, um, I haven't really look, looked at the, uh, at the papers so or paper drafts of uh, um, electromagnetic follow-ups for, uh, um, for this event, but I expect that uh, for the first one, although it was a large patch in the sky, the completeness of the follow-up, so the idea of taking all the telescopes that looked and all the uh, uh, windows that they looked in and and see how much of the probability they covered was very high. It was like 90%, at least if you put several bands together. Uh, for this one, it might have been less. I mean, one, one of these is 1,500 uh, square degrees in the sky. Rates, so now we have three events, or two and a half, you know, two and, and uh, you can, again, do a, um, some kind of inference on the rates that you have. And so these are the, uh, these are the rates for the three types of events individually. So the idea is that you see one like this and you, um, you estimate how many you have. And, and you see the fact that you've seen, uh, uh, you've seen a fainter event with smaller masses um, means that uh, uh, your rate must be higher. Okay, since it's, it's going to be, uh, if, you, if, you, if you see only a strong thing, that means that, and, and you see only one of it, that leads you to a low rate. Probably there aren't many like that, otherwise you've seen more. But if you see a fainter thing, uh, then uh, uh, that means that there are going to be more like that. And uh, the, these two down, down below are, as I was explaining yesterday, are rates where you, you do counts of uh, uh, observed events, and then you have to assume something about the distribution of masses and therefore the distribution of strengths of the signal that you actually have in, uh, in nature. So if you make for a flat, means flat uh, in uh, logarithmic mass, you could assume that's the distribution of black holes. And you take that and you figure out how far you can see them. Yes? Uh huh? No, you don't. You don't. But, uh, um, but astronomers are interested enough that they give it a chance and, and look. And also astronomers are not told initially what the masses are. <laughs> they just told this position in the sky, which is, you know, mm, I'm not quite sure why this policy is, is like this, whether it's uh, to make sure you don't give them, I suppose it's out of safety, that if you give them the wrong masses, you've done, you've done bad parameter estimation, they, they don't look because they're black holes and then they lose a Newton star binary. So, yes? Charged electrically. Um, so I would say that um, it's a question for the astrophysicists also. But of course, there, there are you can do solutions with charged black holes in Maxwell-Einstein theory. That they're uh, they're called I don't even know, remember what the 
Nordstrom, Nordstrom, yeah, Ryzen Nordstrom. But astrophysically, uh, you think you lose the charge immediately to the interstellar medium, effectively, and so on. There's no way for, for, uh, for really any uh, macroscopic body to remain significantly charged. And uh, it may have a little, I guess, but, but, uh, but not in the units where it changes the geometry and so on. Um, so, but if you believe there was a reason, I, um, I suppose you could, uh, uh, you could certainly change your solutions to uh, change your solutions to, to look for it in the spirals. There, there are some strange solutions. Right? There, there are these Papa, Papa Petru solutions, is it, where uh, if, if you, you can arrange black holes actually to be in a static configuration by balancing out the, um, balancing out the gravitational field and the electric field. I think that's correct. Um, okay, so what else? Okay, um, I promised that we were going to try to look at data interactively, okay? So this is a very high risk <laughs> exercise, but I, I, I like you enough that I'm, I'm willing to be embarrassed in front of you. So, okay, so we go to a browser. I must tell you, I'm a, very, I'm a big fan of uh, Python as a computing language, as a computing language for science. Uh, it's gotten more and more uh, popular over the last few years, so much that it's, it's even hard at this point to, to be original and saying I like it, because everybody says, oh, of course, that's what we use every day, right? Um, so this was adopted, so, so there's a, LIGO has a, a very virtuous, I would say, a, a thing, very, very virtuous, okay, can I go full screen here? Probably like this, no, like this. Uh, LIGO Open Science Center. Okay, it's, it's actually, I'm saying it's virtuous because I, I, I played a part in, uh, you know, in building it. At the same time, it, it was not spontaneous virtue. It was something that the National Science Foundation actually <laughs> required LIGO to do because they were saying, look, we've given you all this money and you're taxpayer funded. If you're taxpayer funded, you'd better offer your products and your data to the public. Uh, to which LIGO said, oh my God, no, we, we can't do that because uh, you know, it's so complicated to look at, we haven't seen anything, and then we're, we're going to get uh, a million crackpots. We're going to look at the data, find events there, publish a paper, and then it'll be a nightmare, it'll be a PR nightmare. You know, so, so, so some kind of um, compromise was struck in that, uh, uh, well, certainly, for instance, after every confirmed detection, immediately LIGO would re re release the data around the detection. But also there's a plan for releasing the full data uh, after you know, we've looked into it and, may, and cleaned it also. It's not just a question of, of finding, the, finding the gravitational waves, it's also a question of uh, taking out the instrumental events that again would be interpreted like something uh, you know, exceptional or extraordinary by, by, um, by people who don't have cognizance about the, the experiment. And the instrument. So then the first exercise actually of the LIGO Open Science Center was then to take all the data from the last two science runs of initial LIGO, so S5 and S6, which together are more than two years of data, and just release those. Okay, so if you go to this website, loscligo.org, uh, you can do things like, uh, I think it's called timelines, uh, five interviews, so let's see, this is run S6, hope my network work, works okay. Yeah, so for instance here, it's a little small, but, but you can see uh, this is all the data that was collected in uh, Science Run uh, um, 6. The height here is the duty cycle, so over some period is, uh, is the percentage of time that the, the detector was actually taking data. So you can zoom in. Uh, I think I have to drag here, okay. And, and then... Uh, uh, you can request to download the data and you get uh, some, some links to, to the strain data. It, it comes to you in an HDF, which is a, a common format. And here there are also software tools to you know, actually load it into various languages and do things with it. Uh, the other thing that this site has, uh, let's go back to the, the home page, is the data releases themselves. So these are uh, the, the discoveries. So for instance, if you go to the uh, September event, you know, the, the, there's a bunch of information about it and plots, and then uh, uh, there's a, you can get to the data. Okay, so the other thing, there's a, there's a tutorial uh, that 
that, uh, that lets you play with the data. Since it's, it's a little more complicated than I would like, uh, I, I, I simplified it a bit, and I wanted to show you a simpler, simpler version. But you could download it here, effectively. There's also a newer tutorial that, that they put up yesterday that I, I hadn't seen before, which uh, will let you do the same things with all three signals. And actually, it also does some kind of match filtering, which is a technique we'll, uh, the standard technique we'll talk about a bit. But again, it's somewhat confusing, and I, I think it could be simplified perhaps by a factor of two, because you know you write code once and it's it's a mess. You write then you write it again and you do a little better. So, so it still need that kind of distillation, that thing. Um, so um, you know, so in the spirit of doing things live, I'm going to take an IPython notebook, a new one, and I've downloaded the data already in my directory. But again, you can. Uh, uh, you can actually run this, um, okay, let's not get ahead of myself. So Python, who knows about Python? Okay, pretty good, it's an interpreted language. It's not something like C that you compile, you can just type comments and run them. Uh, who uh, knows about IPython and the IPython notebook and Jupyter? Okay, a little less, so if you know Python and you know the other one, definitely look it up. It's a way to run the code interactively in something that's a notebook. It's something like a mathematical notebook, for instance. So you don't just type things and, uh, and see the result. You, you actually collect what you're doing, what you're doing the, both the, the things you type and the result in a document. You can also annotate the document uh, with um, comments and mathematics even. You can save the document and give it to somebody, and they can, they can just open it, in their, open it on their side, and they'll see all your computations with all the results and all the plots. It's, it's a great way to exchange uh, exploratory you know, data analysis or calculations and so on. And it's, it's, uh, it's also been hailed as a, as a way to do reproducible science because uh, if an analysis is simple enough, you know, it doesn't require strange uh, software packages and so on, you can maybe publish the paper and also, also ship the analysis, the, the data analysis with a data set and somebody else can run it which is not reproducibility, it's just uh, replayability, right? It's a little less. But they can play with it. They can try, uh, you know, doing the spectrum a little different and, and seeing if that changes the final conclusions of the paper. So very, very healthy, very healthy way to, to do things. And a way to, um, to get some openness into uh, computational science. There's this problem that um, uh, I think is vexing and that... Uh, uh, in that uh, a theory paper, right? At the, at the best, a theory paper is like mathematics. It proves things. It makes arguments that are tight. And uh, you're the referee or you're the reader. You look at this thing. Uh, you spend time on it. And at the end, it has the value of proof almost for you. It, uh, you, you go back to, uh, you know, you can build on it. It's scientific and so on. Now take a paper in one of, usually, <laughs> Hopefully. Now take a paper in numerical relativity. Okay, so uh, five paper in numerical relativity by a collaboration of 10 people. They're using a code, a numerical relativity code, that was developed over 10 years. And that is, a, is a lots, of, lots of lines of code, but they don't even give it to you. Okay, because they, they don't want somebody else to run their code and write a paper with it. Uh, so all you see is a waveform. Okay, all, all you see is some claim result. Uh, is there any way to check that? Not really. I mean, it's, uh, you, you'd have, um, um, you have to trust them. You have to trust them at the same level that, uh, um, that you trust an experimentalist who, has, who tells you, you know, I ran this thing with photons and uh, atoms in my lab. Uh, uh, this is what I did. This is what I got. Okay, that's my experiment. And uh, so even then, you know, in a, in, a, in a good experimental paper, there should be enough information that you can replicate the thing in your own lab, uh, just as people try to do with the initial interferon, inter, um, resonant bar detections of gravitational waves. So there's a way for science to do it, but replicating the, uh, the numerical work can be even more daunting because uh, if, you know, if really took 10 years to write that code and uh, uh, you just see a few equations there, but there are a myriad uh, implementation details that uh, you don't have. There's really no way to do it. So things like this, where you can offer code simply and how it runs and offer your data analysis procedure, are a way to, to, to improve on that a bit. Um, because the other thing I should say, so, and then I'll finish my rant, but you know, these, these are the things that... 
I care about is that the standards in computational science are probably much lower than they are in experimental science. So the, I, I bet that the average scientist keeps their code much worse than the average experimentalist keeps their lab. Because there's a, a, it's just easier to do things more, you know, more quickly and more loosely and really, you know, nobody will look at it, not even maybe your, no, your students usually look at it, right? And then they, you know. But anyway, so IPython notebook, Great way to run these things. So it's great that there's a tutorial for gravitational waves. Uh, it's a great way to teach about it. So um, let me get then doing it. Oh, okay. And um, you certainly, to run it, you need the Python installation, which these days is pretty simple because you can download one of these big things like Anaconda or the, uh, what's the other one, Canopy, right? And it gives you all the packages and you just, it's one installer, it works in Windows, Linux, everything. However, you can even run online, right? There's something called Binder now. Um, so this is a, a, a repository, but the idea is that uh, you can put, there's a way to put one of these IPython notebooks online uh, where one click, it will uh, go to this website that's running the service that's offered by some very generous lab, and it will instantiate there, a Python instance run in your notebook, and you can gen, then just run it in your, um, in your browser, just connecting to it. So it doesn't seem to come up, but we'll, we'll see maybe. Lots of people are doing it right now. Um, I'll leave it there for a second and we'll see what, what it does. But there are, there are ways to do these things in the cloud, okay? So you don't even need to do it on, on your machine. Um, okay, let's go now to my IPython notebook. So this is the environment. Uh, here I'm just importing some packages that I had written this in advance because uh, um, so NumPy is how you do matrices, uh, SciPy is how you do some kind of mathematics. These are all Python extensions. Matplotlib is how you do plots. Um, and then we, we're going to read data from, uh, uh, from disk. Read LIGO is a little library that uh, uh, LIGO provided to, uh, to just uh, more easily access this data, although it's, it's already in, uh, so let's go up a little. So we're going to load data, and I have the file here. It's called uh, it's this thing. And I want to get data for interferometer one. And I'm going to get strain, time, and something called a dictionary that I don't really care about. Okay, so let's see if this works. So what, what is strain? Strain is going to be some uh, big array. Uh, how long is it? It's 130,000 samples. So I happen to know, actually, but it's, it's in the dictionary that uh, this data is sampled at, at 4K kilohertz. Okay, so for every second, there are 496 samples. Um, so then uh, the time, right? Time H1 is going to be another array. Uh, so if I look at the difference of the first two samples, it's going to be something like, okay, so that is, it's a, a, a 4,096th of a second. So let's plot it, okay? So what do, what, do I, what do you expect to see if I plot this? Presumably, th these are 32 seconds of data, um, 32 seconds of data around the first Monday event, so you'd expect to see your nice waveform, perhaps, or not. Let's have a look. Here we go, see, in the uh, IPython notebook, it's quite nice because the, uh, the plots even stay in line within your document. If you save it, they stay in the save file, so all self-contained and nice. Uh, however, no, I, I don't seem to be getting the, the signal. Uh, it should be, okay, here there's a big uh, uh, value in time, so I can just uh, uh, let me uh, grab the initial time so that we can do relative things, minus T0. Here we go from zero to 32, okay, that's fine. Um, what do we see here, for instance? What uh, we see that the, uh, the overall amplitude, it's, a, it's of order, you know, almost 10 to the minus 18. That's much larger than the signal that we promised, which was a little below 10 to the minus 21. So the reason here is that, um, um, let's be Socratic, what's the reason? There's noise, right? yes.
Yeah, so remember the, 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 the noise curve really goes up at low and high frequencies. So uh, we, the, the high frequencies here will just give you lots of fuzziness, but the low frequencies will give you a big, big, you know, wonder, a big random walk effectively. So that's probably what we're seeing. That means we do, we do need to do something to see a signal that lies in the sensitivity band of the instrument. So I could, uh, I could also grab the, the, other, the other one, the other interferometer. So L1 for Livingstone one. And uh, change a few things here. Okay, this should be enough. And then I can plot them together. And you say you don't want to plot them together because they'll just get on top of each other. But they actually don't. Okay, the, uh, the red noise, uh, this low frequency noise for Livingstone is so strong that the signal is even displaced from zero. Okay, it's just as an, an, an average of minus two. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Because uh, um, low frequencies, low frequency noise, big ones, we just don't care about. That's not where the instrument is sensitive, and that's not where we are, we're trying to look. Um, okay, so what's next? Let's try a spectrum. Huh? Let's try a spectrum. So for that, you have to take me on faith that I'm going to use some functions of my libraries. Um, Oh, and if you're you know, Python savvy and, uh, and a wizard, I dare you to do it f at the same time as I'm doing it and faster than me. Then, uh, come on, you can do it. You can do it. No? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, I, or or let, let's, actually, this guy didn't come up, so the mind binder thing. So it's possible that the service that lets you run uh, um, is being overrun by Caltech students who want to look at this data. Or, anyway, so there's something called uh, there's a PSD function. Okay, so uh, we're going just to give it the strain, and we also need to tell it what the um, the sampling uh, the sampling cadence of the data is. Right. So which is we said 1496 per second. So I actually don't want to, uh, this gives me the PSD, so the, the, the spectrum effectively, the, and the, a, an array of frequencies. And so then I can plot them. I want to plot them on a logarithmic scale. And let's, oop, and I need to plot also the PSD. Okay, so that this kind of looks like a, a, a LIGO spectrum. It's actually better to plot the square root of this because so, so there'll be less of a dynamic range, you can actually see something. So I'm going to use the square root function for NumPy, abbreviated as MP, which is let me uh, take the square root of an entire array at once. Uh, okay, this looks nice. It's a little smooth, uh, it's very smooth. It doesn't have much, much fuzziness. So there must be some averaging going on, which is what you do in spectral estimation usually. So one thing we can do is actually tell it uh, how uh, how long, uh, we sh F what kind of the length of the individual FFTs that you should do before averaging. Okay, and this is what we get. Uh, this, this looks reasonable. So here you see cosmic variance, or not quite. You see uh, the, the low frequencies. Uh, down here at the very lowest frequency, you know, they, the instrumentalists don't even bother calibrating the signal. Actually, they just cut it out because it doesn't matter. It's, it's things that are changing slowly. It's probably due to the stretching, who knows, of the arm over uh, a few hours as temperature changes. That's, it's not where you're looking. It's a temp experiments are always have, what was the, what's the word for vision? Tunnel vision. They have to have tunnel vision in the right frequencies. Um, these are these lines. Um, so we discussed the lines a bit. So lines are two things, okay? So lines are usually just um, instrumental noise. So if you count here, so these are going to be hertz. Um, so there's going to be line, one line that is, you see my pointer there? Yes, that is at uh, two, three, four, five, six. Strong line there. What is that? If, you're Ameri if you've been to America or... <laughs> 60 hertz. What happens at 60 hertz? Say again, sorry? It's the power, right? It's the power. So which is 60 hertz in the US, is 50 hertz in most of the rest of the world for some reason. Um, and this one here is 30, so it's half. Okay, so these are definitely noise feature that comes in through your electricity, 
And any experiment, there's no way to, <laughs> to take them out, pretty, pretty much. They're, they're always there. Uh, some of these, like this one at, uh, what is it, uh, 200, 300, 400, 500, is related, I think, it's one of the, um, the violin modes of the suspensions. So it's the, the, the typical mode of vibration of these very thin uh, silica threads that keep up the mirrors. And, uh, and the point there is that you're going to have noise there, uh, whatever you do, because you're working at room temperature or I don't know, maybe you have some AC, but you're not working at the temperature of zero, so everything has their KT, uh, thermal KT. Everything is going to shake. However, how do things shake? Things, shakes, things shake at their uh, uh, typical frequencies of oscillations, right? You describe the entire uh, system and uh, you analyze its modes of oscillation. And if it's something like, you know, it's an... Okay, even, even a glass has something, but it's, it's not very good, okay? When you excite it, you're going to excite kind of like a complex motion with, with some, broad, uh, um, some broad spectrum. However, if you, if you take this and you make it into better and better crystal, I don't know, if you make it into a pure carbon lattice or something like that, eventually you, you'll get more and more symmetry in it, and the, uh, the actual modes of oscillation are going perhaps to have very, a very pure frequency. So when you excite it, you just get that mode. You get it very strongly. All the energy goes into that. Uh, but you, you get a, an oscillation that looks like a line like that. So that's one principle. It's you're going to have noise, but you can push all your noise to a, a very uh, pointed uh, delta-like almost thing. And then you just ignore it. Okay? You can notch it out if you want, which is you build a filter that just takes it out, or you know it's there. There are also some lines that are calibration lines that are actually put in experimentally. So you, uh, for instance, at the, end, at the end mirrors, you have a, a parallel uh, hanging pendulum structure with the, uh, that can uh, push on the mirrors using little magnets and, uh, that are, are set on the mirrors and using currents. Um, and when you push, you want to push at some definite frequency. So you, you, go, you know you're, you're doing some kind of actuation on them, which you're reading off in your science uh, uh, measurement. And the reason for that is that because you, that, that lets you monitor the response of the interferometer instantly to a motion at some known frequency. Um, so that, that would be a, um, yeah, it would be a signal injection at a definite frequency and something that lets you monitor the experiment. Um, okay, so, but where were we? The idea was to kind of, to, to then try to use this shape of the noise to, uh, to, to get rid of the, the low frequency noise here. And uh, um, this is known as, uh, okay, let's do more quizzes. <laughs> so, uh, what is white noise? Like, yes? Constant across frequencies, okay? So, um, so what does it mean then to whiten a signal? It means that the signal may have noise that looks like that, that is very strong. Oh, yes, yes. In the frequency domain, that's true. And that's correct. So, so we're going to, to basically divide by that noise, by this noise profile, so that all the noise components are, you know, are, are appear at the same, at the same level. Uh, it's an it's equalization, effectively, in, uh, uh, in audio terms. Okay, so let's see. How do we do that? Uh, to do that, we have to work in the frequency domain. So we're going to take our strain, which is called strain H1, and we're going to take a, a Fourier transform of it, it's a real process, so we're going to take a real Fourier transform. And then uh, just uh, uh, to see that everything works, let's take the inverse Fourier transform, IRFFT. And if I do this, nothing should happen, okay? So I can just plot it again. Again, it's time, minus T0. Let's see if this works. Yeah, I'm back to the, the, this, these two uh, uh, operations are... Uh, the inverse of one another, so I'm just getting back to, to what I need. Now, then, uh, uh, then what, um, so I'm going to call this, this will be the whitened data, except it's not yet, because I haven't done anything to it. So once we go to the frequency domain, then we're going to have to divide it by something, I'll call it a kernel, a whitening kernel. And what's the whitening kernel? The whitening kernel is going to be this curve, effectively. So I'm going to divide the signal by that curve, um, so to do that, uh, I, I have to do 
I have a little problem, which is this curve, since I've done some averaging, doesn't have the same length of the spectrum of the other one. So I'm going to have to do some interpolation of it. Um, so that's done, let's see. I'm going to, to first use a, a little function. It's a utility function that will just tell me what the frequencies are for my final, uh, for, for a signal of the uh, length I need. I need also to tell it what my um, uh, delta t is between steps. And then I can build a kernel doing interpolation of uh, uh, the, uh, the spectral frequencies I got, fs, and the, PS, and the square root of the psd. Uh, so let me define a dt equal to this 1, 0 over 496. Here I'll use the dt. And now for reasons that uh, are always confusing to me, so I won't explain, you have to divide, you have to normalize a little and divide by 2 over dt. This gives you the right uh, uh, dimensions, really. Okay, so let's see if this works. Ah, nice error, let's see. PSD is not defined because I called it PSDH1. Well, this is good enough. Seems, you know, the operation was done, so let's, look, let's see how it looks like now. So pp plot, time H1. White and H1. Oh, uh, okay. There's some edge effect. Clearly, something happened here, which these things always happen when you do FFTs. But let's look somewhere in the middle, and in particular, I want to see around the time of the event. The time of the event in this in here is uh, I have to copy it. So time of event is one one two six uh, two five nine four. 62422, September 14, 950 UTC. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to build uh, a. I, I want to restrict these arrays to just some time around it. So I can do it. Now we're getting into somewhat a little sophisticated uh, uh, Python. So I, I'm going to be the, build an index like this that tells me that. Uh, that selects just the uh, um, elements in the array where the time lies between five seconds before and after the event. We'll call this index. And, uh, yeah. and then let's have a look first at the no white end signal. And by doing this, brackets int, I select just those, uh, those times. Okay, so this is just a blow up of the big curve here. Okay, that, that, that thing was very noisy, couldn't really see what was going on. Here it's very clear that the signal is dominated by frequencies of order uh, going up here of order five seconds, okay, with periods of, I say, five seconds. Definitely we cannot see the event there. So let's look at our whitened uh, plot. Yes? Oh, sorry. Hi. So I, I, I do forward Fourier transform, I divide by my whitening kernel, so by the square root of spectrum, and then I take the inverse transform. So I go back to time, because I, I want to see a time. But yes, good, good, good point. I, I did it a little uh, implicitly. So let's see if it works. Well, it's whitened, uh, still kind of messy, <laughs> right? So there's, uh, what else can I do here? Well, remember, uh, you know, this signal was a signal between 30 and 150 hertz. Uh, there's a lot of LIGO, there's a lot, LIGO takes data up uh, to, well, up to 60 kilohertz, but is, in this case we're using data sampled at 4 kilohertz, so there's going to be all the noise components between 150 and uh, 2000, the uh, Nyquist, right, if you know a little data noise frequency, so it's all there, although this peak here, hmm, that, that may be something. Okay, so uh, also by, by doing this normalization, now the units are sigmas effectively, of the, of the white noise. So most of it will be one, there's a little two, a four sigma, that may be the signal. So what else can I do on a, on a, in addition to whitening? I can do some band passing. How about that? How about we kill off some of the frequencies we don't care about? So for that, uh, I'm going to be very pragmatic. The other tutorial builds a Butterworth filter, which is a nice smooth filter that, uh, that uh, you could use in an audio amplifier to get a nice response. I'm just going to take the kernel and uh, 
how did I do it here for brevity? Yes. And I'm going to say uh, where the frequency is less than 30 maybe, or where the frequency is more than uh, 200. Actually, let's do 20 and 200. I just set this to what? Zero? Or actually infinity, because I'm going to divide by this, right? So I want. So, let, so this would be whitened and uh, filtered, let's say. So let's have a look. Uh, did I run this? No, MPINF, right? Okay, so maybe I want to look a little closer then. So let's go between minus one and one. This is still not very inspiring. Well, this guy begins to be there. So let's go even a little closer. Remember, this thing was 0.2 seconds. Five. So I'm changing my index. Still, you know, still not visible there. But here it is. Okay, so that's, that's a plot that was on the paper. That's a... You know, they did it more carefully, they were careful in filtering and so on, but this, this is pretty much it. And we can, uh, we can just do a, a, a little uh, test of consistency by doing the same thing for, uh, for the other guy, for, for the Levinson interferometer. I need to make the spectrum, I think, because I didn't make it up here. Spectrum is similar, but to be careful, let's... Uh, you know, let's do it separately. So again, PSDL1, strain H1, and then here I want PSDL1, and then finally it will be white and, and filtered at one. And then let's plot them together. Okay, and they, they don't line up completely because remember there's the time of propagation. So we need that to shift them by, uh, what was it, seven milliseconds? So let's see, if that, let's see if that thing, that works. I think it worked for me here, so it should work for us also. Plus zero, zero, 007. Oh, and what's missing? Somebody was pointing it out yesterday. A minus, excellent. So. Here we go. So they, they definitely line up up here, and that's your coincidence. Down here, it's mostly noise. And just as a, as a, as a further check that uh, the theorists also know, know their job, uh, from the same web page, you can download a um, time, you can download a numerical relativity waveform that was computed at, at the best uh, uh, guess for the parameters. So it's this, this guy here. I have to turn it around to do the two columns, and then I can just, let's have a look. PP plot, time and R, train and R. Okay, so the units are the physical ones, whereas here we went into units of sigmas, so we probably want to divide by something like one e to the minus 21, and maybe multiply by three, something like that. So let's try to plot it on top of the other two. And uh, give, me, uh, give me something longer. This looks fine. Let's see, what did I do wrong? Big size. Okay, well, I put it at zero, so I, I need to do something to, to this time index, probably add t event. Uh, almost there. Let's see, so uh, a little too big, maybe? No, a little too long. So let's uh, limit the axis. We'll go from uh, uh, t event minus uh, 0 0.2, that's going to be x min to uh, T event plus 05, something like that. Okay, so I think there's still a little shift just because the numerical relativists didn't quite put it at, uh, at the right time. Uh, and I actually computed it. It's uh, this, 002. Oh, no, no, it doesn't go here. It goes here. Okay, here it is. 
and we can make it a little smaller. A little smaller. Um, oh, what's miss something is missing here. It doesn't quite match because then I, I promise I'll do something else after this. I'm, I'm just, just having fun, but it can be a little boring. So we need to whiten this guy also. Right, so actually, let not, let, uh, yeah, let's just do it, okay, so, um, so I'll just copy this code I have here, and we're going to use it on strain and R. Uh, let's use the Livingstone uh, PSD, uh, it doesn't matter, strain, strain and R, whiten and R. Then uh, let's plot that, whiten. R. And then I probably don't need to um, even do this job anymore because the whitening will do it for me. Uh, the problem being that uh, X and Y must have the first dimension. Um, yeah. This thing took me a long, it took me 20 minutes yesterday to figure out. For some reason, the, um, the numerical relativist gave us a waveform with an odd number of samples. Therefore, when I'm doing the Fourier transform, I lose one, and then when I do the inverse Fourier transform, it doesn't match anymore. So, but now it does. Okay, ta-da! Okay, so, <laughs> so here's my uh, here's my demonstration that numerical relativity works. That the signal propagated uh, at the speed of light. Uh, well propagated in seven milliseconds, and that if you do a, a sign flip, they, they match nicely. And also that, you know, making that figure for PRL was not that hard. Uh, so um, I'm going to, I, I won't do live the, the other thing I wanted to do. I'm just going to show you here what it looks like, which is uh, if you do a spectrogram of the data, for instance, H1, the function is called spectgram, it's part of matplotlib. You get something like this. So, um, what do you, this is uh, you know time again, the seconds within this this uh, little uh, data file between zero and thirty-two, and on the y-axis is frequency. I should annotate it. But uh, so uh, what? Or what can you see? <laughs> so uh, definitely, what are these green things? Green things there. I should put a legend. But green means big here, and blue. Those are. The instrumental lines, the noise lines, you know, you know, really yellow down here at low frequencies. So, you know, but still, see this little thing there? The little cloud? Okay, that's probably our signal. It's at the right shape. So what you can do is then uh, um, plot the whitened data. Not quite the, uh, we don't even need to bandpass it for this. And, you know, it's, it's not, a, there's quite a bit of tuning you can do in, in how you make the spectrogram, how long the individual FFTs are going to be and so on. But it's there, right? It's the chirp. And what I plot here, so there's a Hanford and Livingston. What I plotted here is just the, the, the thing that we derived the, the other day, the um, evolution of the, the instantaneous evolution of the frequency due to uh, just the quadruple emission for a, a Newtonian binary. So I, I matched it as well as I could, just by eye. Actually, I didn't even do a fit, but uh, it's, it's not expected to match actually too well because remember, this is a very, uh, a very advanced stage in the spiral. It's, it's going very fast, so post-Newtonian corrections and eventually even the merger are, are going to dominate the signal. It's not supposed to be Newtonian. But if you do this job actually in this earlier part and be a little careful, do a fit, that's how you'd get out this chirp mass of 30, which was the, the first thing you can measure about the signal and it, which is the thing that convinces you that these are two black holes. Uh, so I encourage you, if some of you like this kind of things, you know, definitely download the data and uh, the, uh, look at the other tutorial. You, you have to read through it a little more carefully. Um, and, you know, play with it because it's, uh, I think it's competitive. I think if you had to play with the CMB, it would be harder to do probably, to download a map and, uh, and do a fit with CAM, although, you know, we, we saw how to do it. And uh, so maybe not, maybe it's comparable. You should do both, okay? Download a Planck map and fit it and, uh, <laughs> and download this and, and, and try to plot it. So, um, Okay, let's see. Then I have 15 minutes, is that right? Or, okay, 
Questions on this? Since uh, I had so much fun, it's, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you don't, you cannot clean it enough to see it. So what they plot is actually the reconstruction. The, and the idea is that with uh, uh, match filtering, so, okay, that's what I can talk about in 15 minutes, uh, about match filtering. You can actually, um, you can actually draw out even a signal that's under the, under the noise. And the rule of thumb is that, uh, um, although normally, in noise, I'm looking at you. So no, no, noise you, you discuss in terms of sigmas, right? One sig if something is above one sigma, you, you more or less see it. If, above, if it's above two sigmas or four, like there, it's definitely big. Okay, but uh, uh, however, you also have many cycles. So if, if you know the shape of your signal, or if you know the frequency, if it's just a sinusoid and you know this, the frequency, you effectively get an, an enhancement of a square root of the number of cycles. So then it's 55 cycles, so the, the signal may be something like, uh, you know, point to sigma. And still, you can see it in a, in a statistical term. You can reconstruct it, but you won't see it in the data. So, Rafael, did you convince yourself that you were seeing it, or uh, no. you don't know? For well, that one, it may be, yeah, it may be. So I, I think if you did the... Uh, uh, because if, you, if it was just a, a monochromatic signal, you could really do just uh, do a very tight filter, and then you should get it out. But it's not, so it's, it's not a filter. It's a filter that you need to do, but it's not spectral. It's, it's a chirp filter. You have, you have to have the... You do, but... Yeah. Okay, that, that's a good point. So you can filter at some frequency, you still get something. So, so maybe there's a, ch there's a chance to do, they didn't do it, so, but maybe the, the, if you're careful about it, you can actually filter in a way that you see something at least. So I think Rafael was doing it live yesterday during the uh, press conference and it was impressive. So, okay, so let's go back to my presentation then. Uh, I think it gets to match filtering pretty quickly, so that's what I can do today. And then I, uh, I had planned to tell you also about Markov Chain Monte Carlo, which is my other passion in life, and I, I'll do that tomorrow. So, um, gravitational wave science in a, in a nutshell. Really, any, yes? that look like chirps. Yeah. Okay, that would be a specific thing in, in LIGO, that they use in LIGO, it's, it's being written by LIGO people. There's something called the LAL, the LIGO algorithm library. It's, a, it's actually, you can download it, there's a repository. It's a little painful to build it, you know, you, you, need, a, you need to have the right compiler. And, no, actually, it's not quite a question of the right compiler. You have to have, to have some libraries and so on, but I, I can build it in half an hour, okay? And, um, 20 minutes, maybe. Um, and that library has lots of stuff. Actually, the people started it maybe in the, in the 90s to do it, and they, it was some very idealistic people. They even wrote the matrix libraries, the, their, um, lo lots of basic things. Uh, today, it's also, it's interface with Python. So the, the, the library is a C library, but it's got the Python, uh, what's the word, uh, wrappings. It's wrapped in Python, so you can actually write little Python scripts that, uh, that do it. So m maybe I'll, I'll try to do it tonight just to show you an example. So for instance, with that, you can uh, easily generate a waveform using one of the standard uh, interpolants, one of the standard models that, that have all the post-Newtonian uh, corrections and even numerical relativity corrections. Uh, if you can generate those, you can certainly make a bank, so make many different ones, and then you can filter the data through it. It will take some time because it's, it's a lot of data, and it's normally done on, computing on big computing clusters in LIGO, but it's, it's a, if you know where the signal is, you can just cheat and do 32 seconds, and then you'll find it quickly, okay? So, okay, gravitational wave science in a nutshell. Uh, data is signal plus noise. Okay, that doesn't quite go without saying, uh, doesn't quite go without saying, okay, because uh, uh, the, the hypothesis we have here is that noise is additive, but uh, a noise that is multiplicative or something is so scary that almost nobody wants to think about it. But I think it comes about, for instance, in, uh, in, in CMB analysis in some cases, or 
in, uh, in Planck analysis. Um, okay, so here's my signal. It's just a little blip up and down. This is white noise, so I'm, I'm hiding the signal in the white noise. So once you're here, you kind of see it, you know, it goes up and down, but it's pretty well hidden. And SNR05 is, 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 is kind of high already. So now, then what you're going to ask, one way to look at detection is the following. You say, uh, what's more likely? Okay, it's more likely that this thing that I see is just noise or that there's the signal. And if there's a signal, it means that the, the real noise is this thing I see minus the signal and, and therefore is this guy here. Okay, so just on a very qualitative term, I'm asking which one is more like it, which one is more probable. And so how do you tell? How can I tell if this is more probable than that? Remember, it's white noise. Take what? Oh, now I have only one detector. I, I'm doing it even more simply at the level. So, um, yeah, we're making assumptions about noise. We're saying that it's white noise. Actually, I'm going to tell you something else. It's Gaussian noise, okay? It's, the, it's distributed the simplest way I, I can, I can uh, think of, and it's also the, let's say, the average of noise is zero, which people usually like to take. In that case, what you can do is just, well, ask which one is bigger okay, of these two, particular which one has more power. So take the square of all these things, sum it up, and the one that has uh, uh, more power is going to be more, less likely, right? It's uh, noise, uh, is, smaller noise is always more like, likely than larger noise in this sense. So then that would mean that uh, I, if I compute this thing, this guy would be, uh, the, the power of this uh, subtracted signal would be smaller than this one, so there's going to be some probability that this is larger. And uh, if, you, if you actually do the, work out the probability, well, maybe we'll do it tomorrow for, uh, it's, very, it's very simple, but the idea is that uh, uh, the, uh, the probability for this noise to happen as opposed to that one, uh, the ratio of that is, is something like an exponential of SNR squared, this five I was telling you about. So in this case, it's 270,000. So they really look kind of the same, but if you compute the power, this one is much more likely than the other one. And the difference is this, uh, the signal itself. In practice, there's another way to look at it, which is match filtering. Okay? Match filtering is based on correlation. And the general idea is this. Uh, take my signal, again, not very inspiring, but a simple one. And I take the signal, the product. So if I take an integral of the signal, sum it up, I get zero, actually, because it's symmetric. However, if I multiply with itself, I get something that obviously is always positive, positive indefinite. And then if I take an integral of this, I get, say, 25, which is square of 5, right? It's not casual. It's not, it's not random in this case. Now, let's say I take just noise, white noise, some instantiation of noise, and I multiply that by the signal. What do I get? I get more noise, right? Because this thing is going to be up or down, positive or negative, just randomly. Okay, so then this is noise again, and the integral of noise it cannot prefer by symmetry positive or negative, it's going to be small. So the idea then is, if I, I can compare these two numbers, um, I can compare these two numbers by taking my data, multiplying it by the signal I think is in it, and if there is no data, I'm going to get this number. If there is a, there's a signal in there identical to this, I'll get this number plus this, of course, right? Something like that. This is the basis of match filtering, and it's really the same as what I was describing here, except that uh, you know, here I'm doing it with uh, subtraction and here with mult multiplication, but it's, uh, um, it, it, it's really the same thing that I'm doing. So then to show, show it to you in practice before, before I finish is let's say uh, this is my, uh, this is the data. It's whitened, uh, you know, and a little filter to make it easy for you. But let's say that I, I doubted that uh, there's actually a signal here, that I wonder whether there's a, uh, there, this may not, not be only noise. So what I'm going to do then is to take my um, theoretical uh, notion of the signal, just of the perfect chirp, and I'm going to do this job of multiplying it, correlating with the noisy data, and I'm going to slide it and do this multiplication at different time shifts, okay? So kind of like this. And you see as I do it, I build this curve the red curve, so I'll, I'll, do, I'll do it again. So while this is sliding through, you see a red bar here that marks kind of like the values on this red uh, uh, curve. 
then uh, it, can, it can make it go out the other way. So you see this red is this, is a correlation between the, uh, this, the detector data and my signal template, the, my ideal form for the signal, uh, time shifted, and uh, as a function of the time shift there, then I'm going to see a peak that tells me what is the optimal, optimal alignment. Okay, so where the template is, is perfe perfectly, or, or not perfectly, but is aligned as best as possible with the signal. Um, so th this is the time term of coalescence. Or rather, yeah, yeah, the time of coalescence if I put the zero of my template on at the top. And if you do it for the two, you get again the seven milliseconds. Uh, also the height of this peak with respect to the, you know, the random fluctuations that you have here is again this signal to noise ratio is, is what tells you how much confidence you have in your detection. In that, that thing is really signal. Uh, in practice, uh, you can get fooled by the following. Uh, the noise of the instrument is not going to be perfect. It's not to be Gaussian noise. Sometimes the instrument just goes a little crazy and just has a, you know, a fit of uh, so, 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 some big noise, some big peak, something that's not, that, uh, that you don't expect statistically. That's known as a glitch, okay? an, an interferometer glitch. So um, if I, one thing is that uh, if, if my noise here has like a huge peak at one point, just a delta, even if I, if I, whatever function I slide against it, it will still give me something very high. And the reason is that, and something that will let, make me suspect you know, there's, there's really a signal that there's a detection. And the reason is that I, I don't expect noise that big. It's just outside my model in a way. Uh, so to, to kind of cure this problem, people have come up with ways to make sure not only that this thing is big, but also that, for instance, you get uh, uh, reasonable contributions from all parts of the spiral. So that's what's known as in the business as a chi-square test because you're splitting up your signal, your template, maybe in frequency or sometimes in space, and you want to check that uh, you know, you're matching all parts of it and that it's not just one little piece that's giving you a huge match. So that's then uh, uh, this chi-square function you see is uh, in this case big is bad. So if this green curve is big, it's because uh, I, I'm getting some SNR, but the alignment is very bad. So then the, um, actually the blue was this, so the red is the blue corrected by this, uh, uh, this quality, uh, this data quality check, which uh, makes sure all the, the waveform matches. And the reason is that you want to avoid things like that. So this is from a webcomic by one of the LIGO students actually. So, but what's, what, she's, what, what she's showing here uh, is that, uh, so that's a chirp, right? That's, that's a real signal. These things are all glitches. Right, the things that just happen in the instrument due to some strange coupling between, uh, I don't know, interferometry or, or whatnot. And uh, yeah, you can get a raindrop. This is just a, this is a, what, what is this? It's a broadband burst of noise, right? Very red, so very strong. You, you, you probably don't expect some, something like that in terms of statistic. Or even can have some, some repeating frequency pattern. Or I don't actually know what who Tomte is. So I, I, was, I tried to Google it yesterday and couldn't find it. So if you, if you know, you can enlighten me uh, afterwards. But uh, getting rid of this kind of glitches is something you need to do, and, and this kind of chi-square statistics help you do that. Um, so let me actually stop here, and so I, I, can, I can send you to, uh, to coffee. But if you, have question, if you have a quick question, I can take it. Otherwise, just come ask me, and uh, we'll continue tomorrow.